Brother Robert Dodson, who led the prayer just now, has worked closely with me in planning lectureship programs, and he was the one that came up with the excellent suggestion for the theme of this lectureship, The Light Shineth in Darkness. And I just wanted all of you to know that, and we appreciate Brother Dodson, and we appreciate the Birdville congregation very much. We have one of their elders here, Brother David Smith, who is a dear friend and I think an outstanding elder in the Lord's Church. And we just want the Birdville congregation to know how much we do love and appreciate them. Brother Sam Matthews is going to be our speaker, and he is a multi-talented individual. Uh, about three or four years ago, when he and America were living in Vernal, Utah, a friend and I went there for a gospel meeting and had the privilege of staying in their home. And we enjoyed it tremendously and fell in love with the Matthews family. They're a great family. And uh, I learned to appreciate him so, so very much. He's an amazing individual. Uh, Sam doesn't know what timidity is, that's for sure. Uh, he has uh, certainly pressed the cause of Christ in that area in a commendable way and has confronted Mormonism. And uh, it was amazing what he and America had accomplished in regard to taking the gospel into the school system there uh, in their very uh, tactful way and uh, confronting the erroneous doctrines of Mormonism. Uh, he is from Detroit, Michigan originally. He's received a bachelor's degree from Southern Illinois University and is nearing completion on a master's degree from Southern Christian University down in Montgomery, Alabama. And more important than all of that, he's a graduate of the Brown Trail School of Preaching. <laughs> and we're mighty proud that he is. He is also a retired naval officer. He was a lieutenant in the Navy, which is uh, comparable to a captain in the Army or the Marine Corps, and was on the nuclear-powered submarine duty. So he is a man of extensive background in a varied uh, sort of way and uh, a very capable individual in every way. And we love him very dearly. We're looking forward to hearing him speak on the darkness of Mormonism. Sam, you've got 40 minutes and this little blue box here tells you of the diminishing time. <laughs> We thank God and we thank our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Creator, for this exalted privilege to address such a large and intelligent assembly as we have before us this morning. Your presence here is surely an encouragement to me. And we also are thankful for this Brown Trail leadership their continued support of this great annual lectureship. We are indeed honored and we are thankful. We are humbled to have been asked to speak on this lectureship on the subject of this hour, the darkness of Mormonism. And we hope, trust, and pray that the things that we share with you will be uplifting, it will be informative to each of you. In the lectureship book, we dealt with the historical facts concerning Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism. We also detailed the origin of the Book of Mormon. And as you read that lectureship book, you'll notice that we trace the movement of Mormonism from uh, New York all the way to Utah. We concluded our written remarks by zeroing in on some of the more glaring eras of Mormonism as documented in their own literature. We are confident that you have a, a useful resource on Mormonism as well as the many other cults that we've uh, heard about even today in your lectureship book. So again, as Brother Hope mentioned this morning, we hope that you will purchase a lectureship book. Let us pray. Father, as we speak to your people and to those who might be listening via the cassette tapes, via the videos, we pray, Father, that 
you might help them all to understand the things that they are hearing. Those, dear Father, who are caught up in this Mormonism doctrine, we pray for them, Father, that you might open their eyes now as they hear these words. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> My beloved friends and brethren, the Bible encourages honest souls to search and study in order to find the truth. Real truth has no fear whatsoever of investigation. You see, we ought to prove all things and then hold fast that which is good. First John chapter 4 and the verses 1, Jesus said, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. John chapter 5 and the verses 39. Again, the Holy Spirit led the Apostle Paul to write to study. And he said, I'm going to give you three reasons why you ought to study. He said, study to show thyself approved unto God. Do you know that Jesus was a man who was approved of God? Acts chapter 2 and other verses 22. He said, study so that you can be a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 1 and the verses 16. He said, study so that you can rightly divide the word of truth. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and the verses 16, the Bible tells us that if we would just learn the truth, we won't be like those who are unlearned, who rest the scriptures. We'll be able to rightly divide the truth. But you must study the word, you young preaching school students. Those noble souls in Berea, the Bible says they search the scriptures daily to see whether the things that Paul and Silas were saying were so. Acts chapter 17 and the other verses 11. Therefore, in our remarks this morning, we intend to contrast what the Bible says concerning Mormonism, my loved ones, as time allows us. And Brother Max, he has already told me I've only got 35 more minutes to go. Our intent is not to ridicule or to persecute Mormons, for we recognize that Mormons are sincere. We recognize recognize the sincerity of these people, the goodness of many Mormon individuals, but we are concerned that the truth be made known, because if Mormonism is not what it claims to be, then the Mormon people are in grave danger of being eternally lost, being separated from God Almighty, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verses 7 through 10. The areas that we will discuss this morning are the false teachings of Mormonism concerning God, concerning Jesus the Christ, concerning the Holy Ghost, and concerning the Bible. The first article of faith of Mormonism states, We believe God, the eternal Father. We believe in God, the eternal Father, and in his Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. Now that declaration from Mormonism sounds like a scriptural, denominational statement of faith. From it, many people conclude that Mormons are Trinitarian in their view of God. But in fact, loved ones, Mormons reject the concept of one triune God, and they believe in polytheism. They believe that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are three gods. Joseph Smith Jr. said, I have always declared God to be a distinct personage. Jesus Christ, a separate and distinct personage from God the Father, and that the Holy Ghost is also a distinct personage personage and a spirit and these three constitute three personages and three gods that's from the teachings of the prophet 
Joseph Smith on page 370. On the same book in page 349, Smith went on to say, in the beginning, the head of the gods called a council of the gods. My loved ones, Joseph Smith even attempted to make the Bible teach polytheism. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, quoting from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5, where Paul said, there be gods many and lords many. Oh, Smith said that Paul made no allusion whatsoever to the heathen gods in this text. Well, we need to read the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 8 to see just what Paul was talking about. Beginning with verse 4, listen to what the Bible says. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. Now, verse 5, for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, Joseph Smith using that, but look at verse 6, but to us there is but one God the Father, of whom all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. My loved ones, it is a direct contradiction. The Bible shows us that God plainly is talking about the idols. The Apostle Paul plainly says that these idols, these pagan gods, is what the context is going on. But Joseph Smith said, no, he's not alluding to any idols. He's not alluding to any pagans, but he's talking about the many gods. But my loved ones, what does the Bible goes on to say? Paul went on to say, but there is only one God for us. These pagan idols aren't anything in God's sight and in our sight because we know that there's only one God. So this verse surely does not teach polytheism as Joseph Smith tried to claim. In the Bible, each member of the Godhead is called God. The Father is called God. God in John chapter 17 and the verses 1 through 3 and the Son is called God in John chapter 1 and the other verses 1 and the Holy Ghost is called God in John chapter 4 and the other verses 24 God is spirit and in Acts chapter 5 verses 3 and 4 but the Bible does not teach there are three gods from the very beginning of God's word all the way to the end. It only teaches that there is but one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. My loved ones, that's in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and the verses 4. And then Jesus also quoted that in Mark chapter 12, beginning with verse 29. My loved ones, Isaiah, he has something to say about this. God speaking through the prophet Isaiah, the great king of Israel, the Lord of hosts, he said through Isaiah, I am the first and I am the last besides me there is no God Isaiah chapter 44 and other verses 6 but one reason why the LDS people are so confused about God the Father is that they have tried to understand God as if he were a mortal man in their book the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, chapter 130 and the other verses 22, it says the Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's, the Son also, but the Holy Ghost has not a body of flesh and bones, but is a personage of spirit. Uh, were it not so, the Holy Ghost could not dwell in us. Uh, my loved ones, like some during the days of the psalmist, they think that God is altogether such a one as them. Psalm 50 and the verses 12. But God is infinite. God is from everlasting to everlasting. Psalm 90 and the other verses too. He is not a man 
1 Samuel chapter 12, chapter 15, and the verses 29, and Numbers chapter 23, and the verses 19. And since God is infinite, the Trinity is beyond human comprehension. We cannot understand the Trinity. We have finite minds, folks. Man's minds are finite, and therefore we cannot possibly totally comprehend the infinite God. Another reason, though, why the Mormons teach that God the Father has a body of flesh and bones is because they believe that's the way that Joseph Smith saw him way back there in 1820. They also believe that God became God through the process of eternal progression and that men today can also become gods through that same process of eternal progression. Just where the first god came from, however, is an unanswered mystery to the Mormons, much like where life and motion came from is an unanswered mystery to the evolutionists. In fact, the Mormon doctrine of eternal progression teaches that God evolved from being a fallen mortal man. And they even attempt to use the Bible to teach that false doctrine. Go on over to John chapter 14 with me, and let's see what the Bible says about this. In John chapter 14, and the verse is 9, the Bible says, Jesus said to him, Have I been so long kind with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He hath he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? From this they teach that since Jesus Christ has a body of flesh and bones, then God also has a body of flesh and bones. But let's read a little bit further. In verse 10, the Bible says, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me. He doeth the works. Believe me, that I am in the Father, Jesus said, and the Father in me. Or else, believe me, for the works sake. My loved ones, the Bible says that Jesus is in the Father, and the Father is in Christ. If Verse 9 means that the Father has a body of flesh and bones because the Son has a body of flesh and bones. Then how in the world is it possible to put those two bodies inside each other? You need to ask your Mormon friends that, my loved ones. The LDS, they use John chapter 5 and the other verses 19. And they say and they teach that God, the Father, was once a savior of some world. And thus he had to die and be resurrected much like Jesus Christ died and was resurrected for this world. But let's read John chapter 5 and the verses 19. The Bible says, Jesus answered, said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. This verse is not talking about God the Father being a savior of some world somewhere. It says that Jesus Christ did the miracles that God the Father did. Therefore, Jesus Christ should be honored just like the Father was honored. That's all it's talking about. Go down to verse 23. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father. Again, they try to support their claims of a flesh and bones God by saying that he created man in his own image. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Yes, man is created in the image of God, but God was not created in the image of man. Just because man has a body of flesh and bones does not mean that God is made out of the same material. Image does not mean made of the same material. The Bible declares that God is an invisible spirit. 
John chapter 4 and the verse is 24 and that no man has ever seen him John chapter 1 and the other verse is 18 in Romans chapter 1 verses 22 through 23 the Holy Spirit warns of those who would try to make God into the image of corruptible man which leads us into immorality and brings God's judgment down upon him the God of the Bible is omnipotent he's omnipresent he's omniscient and he is unchangeable he is eternal and no God with the body of a man with tangible flesh and bones could have all of those characteristics hold on to your seats now folks Mormonism not only teaches that God is flesh and bones up there in heaven but it also teaches that there is a heavenly mother. Are you with me now? LDS Apostle Orson Pratt, he said, as God the Father begat the fleshly body of Jesus, so he also before the world began begot his spirit. As the body requires an earthly mother, so the spirit requires a heavenly mother. As God associated in the capacity of a husband with the earthly mother, so likewise he associated in the same capacity with the heavenly mother. Pratt, he goes on to say, we have now clearly shown that God the Father had a plurality of wives, one or more, being in eternity by whom he forgot our spirits as well as the spirits of Jesus, his firstborn. Those quotes are from Orson Pratt's book called The Seer, page 158 and 159 and 172. Love once, hopefully, you notice from what I've just said that the so-called mother in heaven is God's wife. According to LDS teachings, from this union of God and his wife up there in heaven, Jesus, the first spirit child born to God in pre-existence, came into being. Such false teachings, my loved ones, have resulted in the radically different Jesus Christ of Mormonism, who we're now going to talk a little bit about. Mormon leaders have taught some strange things about Jesus Christ. Brigham Young, from his earliest Adam God message, he said, when the Virgin Mary conceived the child Jesus, the Father had begotten him in his own likeness. He said he was not begotten of the Holy Ghost. Did you hear that? He said Jesus was not begotten of the Holy Ghost. And who is his father? Young said he is the first of the human family. Jesus our elder brother, he goes on to say, was begotten in the flesh by the same character that was in the Garden of Eden and who is our Father in heaven. Adam is our Father in heaven, he's saying. Now remember from this time forth and forever that Jesus Christ was not begotten of the Holy Ghost, unquote. That's from the Journal of Discourse, volume 1, page 50 and 51. The Journal of Discourse, those things contain the words of the First Presidency of the Mormon Church and the Twelve Apostles of the Mormon Church. And to the LDS people, the words in those books called the Journal of Discourse, those words from those men are just like the words of the Pope to the Catholic. They are the words of God my loved ones. And Young also declared that God revealed to me that Adam is our father and God. And that's in Deseret News, the newspaper, June 18, 1873. My beloved brethren, in Matthew chapter 1 and verses 18, and in Luke chapter 1 and verses 35, both of those passages plainly say that Jesus was begotten by the Holy Spirit. Now somebody is wrong. And since the Holy Spirit says, let God be true and every man a liar, Romans chapter 3 and the verses 4, we know that the Bible is right and Mormonism is wrong. Well, 
dwell in the Mormon concept of eternal progression. Mormons believe that Jesus Christ uh, is Satan and all of us uh, were spirit children with God up in heaven. Now we're still talking about Jesus. Jesus is called the first spirit child born of God in pre-existence. You read that in this old book right here. Um, um, uh, the guy's name is McConkie, Bruce McConkie. And he was an apostle. And he's got a book here called Mormon Doctrine. And he says that Jesus was the first spirit child born of God the Father in the pre-existent state. In the Pearl of Great Price. Another one of their books. The book of Moses chapter 5 and the verses 13. Satan, who they call Lucifer. He said, Satan declares, I am also a son of God. Now Milton Hunter, he was assigned to write one of their books called The Gospel Through the Ages on behalf of the LDS General Authorities. And he said on page 15 of that book, the appointment of Jesus to be the Savior of the world was contested by one of the other sons of God. And he was called Lucifer, son of the morning, haughty, ambitious, and covetous of power and of glory, this spirit brother of Jesus desperately tried to become the savior of, uh, of mankind, unquote. Well, just how did Jesus get to become a God and a savior according to the LDS teachings? Uh, we must first understand, loved ones, that Mormon doctrine teaches that celestial marriage is the gate to exaltation in the highest heaven within the celestial world. Thus, they have these temples, and LDS temple rites include celestial marriage, that is, marriage for time and eternity. I wish I had time to tell you men and women that you're going to be married forever to the same person up there in heaven if you are a Mormon. If all else is in order, then temple marriage will assure one of achieving godhood in the LDS faith. Milton Hunter, he went on to, wrote, to write that Jesus became a god and he reached his great state of understanding through consistent efforts, through continuous obedience to all of the gospel truths and universal law. Unquote. Now listen, since celestial marriage is one of those laws, then Jesus had to be married. Are you with me now? Thus the LDS apostle Orson Hyde, he wrote, Jesus was the bridegroom at the marriage of Cana of Galilee. Journals of Discourse, Volume 2, page 82. LDS apostle Orson Pratt said, if all the acts of Jesus were written, we no doubt should learn that these beloved women, Mary, Martha, Mary Magdalene, were all his wives. From the book, The Seer, page 159, the 10th LDS prophet, Joseph Spielding Smith, he was asked if Jesus was married, and his answer was yes, he was married, but we don't teach it. The Lord advised us not to cast our pearls before swines from a letter dated March 17th, 1963. Thus, many leading Mormons taught that Jesus was not only married, but that he was a polygamist. Some have even taught that Jesus had children by those polygamous wives. For example, the LDS apostle Olson Hyde said, before the Savior died, he looked upon his natural children as we look upon ours. From the Journal of Discourse, volume 2, page 82. Obviously then, this Mormon Jesus is not the Savior that we understand from the Word of God. Now, just a few brief words on the Mormon's Holy Ghost. Mormonism makes a distinction between the Holy Ghost 
and the Holy Spirit. LDS Apostle John Whitstow said, the Holy Ghost, sometimes called the Comforter, is the third member of the Godhead and a personage distinct from the Holy Spirit. As a personage, the Holy Ghost cannot any more than the Father and the Son be everywhere present in person. This is from the book, Evidences and Reconciliations, page 76. And in the same book, on page 62, he claims that the chief agent or agency by which the Holy Ghost accomplishes his work is usually spoken of as the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God. It is the universal feeling medium or influence, uh, unquote. Uh, my loved ones, thus to the Mormons, uh, the Holy Ghost is in touch with the entire universe through the Holy Spirit. But loved ones, if you know your Bibles, and I know that you know your Bibles, uh, then you know that no legitimate uh, distinction can be made between the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. The same Greek words are translated both ways, and they refer to the same being. The Holy Spirit is not simply or solely some kind of influence. He is a person welding an influence, and that is through means, through what means, brother preacher, through the revelation of truth, which he made known through the writers of the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 13. Now for our last point, the Bible. John Talmadge, he wrote to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, accepts the Bible as the foremost of her standard works. First among the books which we have proclaimed as her written guides in faith and doctrine. That's from the Articles of Faith, page 236. Bruce McCarthy, the guy that wrote this book up here, he said, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believe the Bible. Indeed, he says, so literally and completely do their beliefs and practices conform to the teachings of the Bible that it is not uncommon to hear informed persons say, if all men believe the Bible just like Mormons believe, then all men would be Mormons. Woo! Bible doctrine, he says, is Mormon doctrine, and Mormon doctrine is Bible doctrine. They are one and the same from the book, What Mormons Think About Christ, page two. Now, such statements as these have led many to assume that the LDS view the Bible just like we as Christians view the Bible, but uh, such is not the case, my loved ones. Uh, Mormonism actually attacks the Bible on two counts. Uh, first of all, they say it is mistranslated, and secondly, they say it is incomplete. Uh, the mistranslation of the Bible is suggested in the Mormon's eighth article of faith. I quote, we believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it is translated correctly. And we also believe the book of Mormon to be the word of God. Unquote. You notice they didn't say as far as it's translated correctly. Concerning the Bible, Joseph Smith Jr. declared, ignorant translators, careless transcribers, or designing and corrupt priests have committed many errors uh, from the teachings of the so-called prophet Joseph Smith uh, in page 327. LDS apostle Mark E. Peterson, he said, many insertions were made, some of them slated for selfish purposes, while at times deliberate falsifications and fabrications were perpetuated from translated correctly. Page 4, LDS apostle Olson Pratt, he also wrote, if it be admitted that the apostles and evangelists did write the books of the New Testament, that does not prove of itself that they were divinely inspired at the time they wrote. Add all the imperfection to the uncertainty of the translation, and who, he says, in his right mind could for even one moment suppose that the Bible in its present form is a perfect guide. 
he went on to say, who knows that even one verse in the Bible has not escaped pollution so as to convey the same sense now that it did in the original. This is from the divine authenticity of the Book of Mormon, page 45 and 47. Statements such as these, loved ones, they prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Mormon leaders don't believe the Bible. For the Bible says that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. And the Holy Spirit wrote through Paul that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, my loved ones, in Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. In addition to this charge of unreliable translations, Mormon leaders say that important doctrines as well as whole books have been deleted from or added to by corrupt men. When Joseph Smith wrote his own version of the Bible, which I have right up here, if you'd like to see it later on, just read Genesis and you'll start throwing up. When Joseph Smith wrote his own version of the Bible, he said, upon my return from the Amherst Conference, I resumed the translation of the scriptures from sundry revelations which he had received. It was apparent that many important points touching the salvation of man had been taken from the Bible or lost before it was completed from the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, page 9 through 11. The Book of Mormon says, Thou fool that shall say a Bible, we have got a Bible and need no more Bible. Have you obtained a Bible, save it be by the Jews? Second Nephi, chapter 29, and the verses 6. Notice now, according to their book, only fools trust in the Bible alone. My loved ones, the context continues. Wherefore, because you have a Bible, you need not suppose that it contains all my words. Neither need ye suppose that I have not caused more to be written. Second Nephi 29 and the verses 10. You see, by predicting that more revelation was to come, the Book of Mormon may await for its own existence. Those people aren't dumb. Joseph Smith wasn't dumb. This Book of Mormon also declared that a great an abominable church had taken away from the gospel of the Lamb many parts which are plain and most precious, and also many covenants of the Lord have been taken away. First Nephi chapter 13 and the verses 26. The Book of Mormon dates this perversion of the gospel around 600 B.C. Well, my loved ones, that was a long time before the gospel of the Lamb was even given. In the New Testament, Mormons claim that the Book of Mormon has restored these plain and precious things, and that if the Book of Mormon is the fullness of the gospel, First Nephi 13, verse 34 and 35, but they are hard-pressed to name even one thing that the Book of Mormon has restored. It is strange, my loved ones, that Mormons attack the reliability of the Bible, while Talmud calls it the first and foremost book of their doctrine. It is strange, but you know all of the LDS leaders, they don't agree with old Talmud. They don't agree with what the other leaders say about which one of their scriptures is the most important. For example, Joseph Fielding Smith, he was the 10th prophet, the seer, and revelator of the Mormon church. He said, in my judgment, there is no book on earth yet to come to man as important as the book known as the Doctrine and Covenants, with all due respect, he says, to the Bible and to the Book of Mormon and to the Pearl of Great Price, which we say are our standards of doctrine. He goes on to say, the book of doctrines and covenants to us stands in a peculiar position above 
them all above the Bible, the Book of Mormon, and the Pearl of Great Price. That's from the Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 3, page 198. Obviously, then, the Doctrine and Covenants and the Bible cannot both be in first place above all the other LDS scripture. But Joseph Smith Jr., he had something to say about this thing too. He said, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on the earth. And he is the keystone of our religion. And a man could get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts more than by any other book. He said that in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, page 194. So there we have it. Dr. Talmud said the Bible is the most important of the books for the Mormons. Joseph Fielding Smith said that the doctrines and covenants was the most important. And the founder of Mormonism, Joseph Smith himself, declared that the Book of Mormon would get man nearer to God than any other book. Well, who's right? My loved ones, according to them, Joseph Fielding Smith is the one who's the most accurate. You see, the, the LDS believe that the Bible has been mistranslated. That's it corrupted. Therefore, they surely don't believe it's reliable. And the Book of Mormon does not teach Mormon doctrine. It doesn't have very much of the Mormon doctrine in it at all. So, their real book is the Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, my beloved friends, there is no verse in the Bible that says this is the end of all scriptures. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 15 and other verses 19, I have fully preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. If LDS doctrines then are not in Paul's teachings, then they are condemned by Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and verse 9. Brethren, through the knowledge of God, we have been given all things that pertain unto life and godliness, uh, Second Peter chapter 1, and other uh, verses 3. We are complete in Christ Jesus, Colossians chapter 2, and other uh, verses 10. Since these things are true, then what need do we have of any more scripture? It is quite clear that no more scripture is needed because it cannot say anything other than what has already been said, and that would be redundant. And the New Testament writers were eyewitnesses of Jesus' earthly ministry. They saw what he did. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. First John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. They recorded the things in the Bible that they saw and that they heard for our benefit. Although much more could have been written, John said in John chapter 21, and other verses 25, the things that we have in the New Testament are enough to cause all men everywhere to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and believing we might have life through his name. Let the church say amen.